Okay, everybody, let's get let's get her started here. We're uh, uh looking at Polycarp this week. Polycarp to the Philippians. We begin. Let's jump right in here. Let's uh let's get her started up. <clears throat> Polycarp says to them, "I have greatly rejoiced with you in our Lord Jesus Christ because you have followed the example of true love." as displayed by God, and have accompanied as became you, those who are bound in chains, the fitting ornaments of the saints, and which indeed are indeed the true diadems of the true elect of God. So what's he saying here? He's he's beginning, and this is a theme that flows all throughout um, Polycarp's epistle to the Philippians. He's very, very concerned with with emphasizing the practical the how do you say this the practical living of the christian life living the example of jesus christ um so you have this kind of in case you're not familiar with all of these these different kinds of terms a gospel imperative or a uh, moral influence theory of the cross i know that's anachronistic don't crucify me for it um but this this kind of like looking at looking at the life of Christ, the teachings of Christ, the miracles of Christ, even the 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 death and resurrection of Christ as things to be emulated or uh, things to be imitated or things for us to embody, and that's that's one of the ways that he he really uses the cross right as this perfect picture of love. Of course, he speaks of he speaks of the law too, and this is part of his emphasis on well, we'll call it as Lutherans a law emphasis uh, or a works emphasis. Um, but in his mind, of course, this is a this is a love emphasis. This is for him. This is a theosis emphasis for him. This is a transformation emphasis. I know different different Christians from different walks of life uh, will refer to this, think of this differently, but. Alongside that, you have this kind of imitation of Jesus Christ, obedience to the law of God in the Decalogue, and loving one another. He talks about faith, too, and we're going to look at how he talks about faith, because how he talks about faith is very interesting due to the kind of general thrust and use of the law throughout this work. Because when you see when you see an author like Polycarp, at least in this epistle, that is so emphatic about the law, so emphatic about um living in this certain kind of way, even as a condition of eternal life, you would think that the way he speaks of faith would be super conditional, right? But it's not. And we're gonna look at that. So hold on to your boots and your hats and your socks. But anyways, what's he saying? Yeah, he's saying one of the one of the great things that these people, these uh these Philippians did, and this is something that that is uh, very in line with them keeping in step with how they related to Saint Paul the Apostle when Saint Paul the Apostle was in prison, writing to them, you know, the letter to the Philippians of Saint Paul the Apostle. There's still these people, um, dealing with these other people in prison, right? And and this is who he says, right? That you you uh, have accompanied as became you those who are bound in chains, the fitting ornaments of the saints, and which are indeed the diadems of the elect of God and our Lord. And because the strong root of your faith, again, we'll, we'll speak about this in a second. Um, but he's speaking about their love, their relationship with the imprisoned, right? And and of those people suffering, we can assume it's for their faith, right? Um, these are the people who are the diadems, the, the, the crowns, the glory, the ornaments of the elect of God. So then he talks about this, this root of faith, and it's that root of faith from which is coming all of the other things, right? Spoken of in days long gone by enduring even until now, bringing forth fruit, right? And this is what roots do. They bring forth fruit, to our Lord Jesus Christ, who for our sins suffered unto death. And this is where he's bringing that, he's bringing that gospel up, right? And in his, you know, of course, and he he is just quoting the text of scripture. And this is something that uh, Dr. Jordan Cooper always makes note of as well, is you have to be careful when you're looking at patristics to not read into their use of scripture too much, right? Because a lot of the times, they are using scripture in a very minimalistic way, assuming it gets the point across uh, because, 
well, why wouldn't you, right? Unless you had, unless you had already seen everything under the sun, every stupid and incorrect interpretation under the sun, why are you going to assume people are going to have all these different understandings of what the text says? I mean, it is pretty obvious. A lot of these texts are, but the point is, the point is important because you can look at um, uh, the quotations of texts in the Holy Fathers that are not explained. They're just they're proof texts to their site, not even really, because they're not even trying to prove a point. They're just putting it forth. And uh, assuming we all agree on what it means, and you'll see Roman Catholics use that one way, and Lutherans use that one way, and Baptists use that another way. So just something to keep in mind. But anyways, you still have this point, right? He is using this idea of Jesus Christ as the sacrifice for our sins, right? Who, who bore our sins and suffered unto death for our sins, but whom God raised from the dead. And this is a theme that is also very heavy here, this idea of not just death, but resurrection, having loosed the bands of the grave, right? So you have this idea of this, this, this victory over death and sin and the devil, in whom, this is Jesus, in whom through now you see him not, Ye believe, and believing rejoice with joy, unspeakable and full of glory, into which, which joy many desire to enter. Knowing that by grit, and this is why I said, right, this is important to know how he, <coughs> how he is, how he is at one hand, yes, just quoting the text, but also using it in a way that is not weak. He does not have a weak view of the cross, not a weak view of faith, but a strong one. One that is, look here with my mouse, if you can, uh, 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 one that is the root of all of the other stuff he emphasizes, the works, the love, the transformation. There's a root of all that. What is it? Well, it's Jesus received by faith. This is why he says, know that you're saved, not by your efforts, but um, by grace. He says, Be, by grace ye are saved, not of works, but by the will of God through Jesus Christ. Right? It's God who willed to save you, and so he did by that immutable will. Not of works, not because you earned it, not because you did it, not because you manifested it, but because God did through Jesus Christ. And then he says, the wherefore, girding up your loins, serve the Lord in fear and truth, as those who have forsaken the vain, empty talk and error of the multitude, and believed in him who raised up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead and gave him glory. Again, you have this idea of uh, Jesus Christ is at the root of it all, and our faith too, but also this idea of, resurre of resurrection. And, um, you know, a lot of Protestants, I'll just call them Protestants as, as a whole group, they're really good at this, this this resurrection faith stuff but um a lot of the times and i don't think that this is bad right a lot of the times in lutheran churches we emphasize the cross so much that we forget that there's something on the other side of the cross uh, the protestants do the opposite issue right and i think that this is i don't think that i know that this is stemming from us getting something a little too right right uh, we say you know crux uh sola est wait how do you say this crux s no, I'm not going to try because I'm going to forget how it goes. Um, but the cross alone is our theology. The cross alone is our theology. That's what Dr. Luther said. And he's right, right? But um, that might be a little bit of a problem because the resurrection is important too, <laughs> right? And so when Polycarp's speaking of believing in Jesus Christ, he's speaking of believing in Jesus Christ, the one who not only died, but was risen from the dead, right? And not just that, but was given glory, and a throne at the right hand of God. And so you have the ascension too. You have the glory and you have the intercession and you have all these things. He says to him, to Jesus, all things in heaven and earth are subject. This is that This is that Jesus is king stuff, right? Oops, where did I go here? And every spirit serves. Him, every spirit serves. He comes as the judge of the living and the dead, right? Th these are creedal statements, just like we saw, just like we saw in, just like we saw in um, uh, Mathetes, uh, Epistle to Diognetus, that's what it's called. Already in this uh, apostolic uh, patristic uh, period and corpus, you see the creed, the the phrases of the creed popping up here, popping up there, the, the movement, the rhythm, the cadence, because the creed is, it is Christianity, right? He says the blood uh, of Christ, God will require of those who do not believe in him. Now, this is a super interesting idea, but it's one that's found in scripture. It's one that we see when Jesus is... Um, 
Jesus is, you know, the crowd is saying, give us Barabbas, crucify Jesus. And then Pilate says, you know, your blood be on him, not on me. And they say, yes, let his blood be on us and on our children also. You also see this in 1 Corinthians 11 with the eating and the drinking of the Eucharist in, in unworthily, partaking unworthily in the holy sacrament of the altar. And he says, if you do this, God will count you guilty of the bloody and blood of, our, of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is, you know, this is a scriptural idea. How do we understand this? You know, I I have heard from some pastors that the key is to simply not uh, to not overcomplicate it. That if God is looking around and you know He finds His Son dead and He's going to look for someone to blame, and then it's going to be you know this guy who doesn't believe that He's going to blame. Well, you know, I I think that that's a little bit difficult for us to say, for the reason that nobody walked up and murdered Jesus, as Jesus Himself says, nobody takes my life, but I lay it down of my own accord. Um, he offers himself to us as a sacrifice for our sins and as, you know, through that, the salvation of our souls. So when we're when we're kind of looking at these texts, these ideas of God requiring um, of his blood from those who don't believe or of those who partake unworthily, you know, all all we can really say is it's, it's kind of painting a picture of something. And what it's painting a picture of is going back to Genesis and and that Noahic covenant where after the flood, God says to Noah, you can eat of any of these animals now after the flood. Remember, before they were not eating animals, just vegetables and fruits and grains and stuff. And then he says, you can eat of the animals, but not of their blood, um, because there is the life is in the blood, right? And yeah, it's a really complicated thing, but this is what's being hearkened back to. But we, 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 we have to understand that this is painting a picture of something. It's not just the full unbridled reality coming down to us in, in one concept, because we also have this concept, for example, in, in St. Paul and, and um, especially in Hebrews, which is of course written by St. Paul, though some deny this, um, where St. Paul says of those who are not saved, right? The, the body and the blood of Christ are to no avail to them, right? So what is it? Well, is it, is it that they're guilty of the body and blood or is the body and blood for them, but not working for them anymore, right? Is it that it was for them, but then they, they, uh, discounted themselves of this blood. And then we see also that in, for example, Revelation 12, it is through the blood of Christ, the blood of the lamb, that victory has been accomplished. And so, you know, we, you have all these different uses of the idea of the blood of God. It's something that is being required of some of people, of something that is atoning for sin for some people, of something that is, um, what do I want to say? And how do I want to say this? Um, not working anymore for some people like that, that Pauline idea in Hebrews, right? So it's something that's used different ways in different texts. We have to be aware of that. Be careful with that kind of with what we do with that. Um, and we want to be super careful of that because, you know, the blood of Christ is a precious thing. The blood of Christ, we don't just want to say, oh, it's a thing of guilt. No, that's not true, right? It's a thing which is mainly for your atonement. It is a thing which, you know, the life is in the blood. And when that blood is poured out upon us, when we when we drink that blood, we have life, we have salvation. And so it can be really, really tricky. And a lot of people, they want to line all these texts up in this neat kind of way with their closed off parameters and they want to drink a lot of coffee and do a lot of nicotine pouches so that they can make them the sharpest, most accurate statement about this that they can. Look, that's not the point, right? The point is you have to understand. It's pretty clear he's saying that this is a bad thing. It's pretty clear also in the other text, for example, Revelation 12, that the blood of Christ is a good thing. So you have to be aware of this. But then he says, but he who raised him up from the dead will raise us up also. And this I want you to pay attention to. If we do his will and walk in his commandments and love what he loved. This is a terrible, terribly hard thing to say. Um, because what he's saying is, um, you will be saved if you do his will. Now, um, here I've put in the notes here, because you can do that on Logos and Verbum. Oh, I just want to hover over it. That's not how it works. I've written here, is this salvation by law that is as imperative or is this salvation by gospel transformation uh, such as an indicative, right? And there's a big difference there. You might say, well, pastor, that's a, that's a small difference. What are you actually getting at? Well, what I'm actually getting at is this, right? When St. When, when Polycarp is saying um, he will save you, you know, and raise you up with Jesus Christ in that same glory. If you do X, Y, Z, is he saying in order to do that, you must go and, and, and do these laws? Or is he saying, um, those who are saved will do these things. And I know a lot of people are going to try and take a stand there. Um, it is important to understand that, but what's even more important to understand is, um, regardless of what St. Polycarp meant, regardless of how he 
he takes that. We do know, as as at least as Lutheran Christians, that God is the one who works in us, both the will and the works which please him. God is the one who puts in us both you know, the faith and the love with, which we have. And so what, whatever it is that we're talking about, we need for salvation. And this is the thing. Everybody in this in this whole faith verse, ver, verse works debate is 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 fondling a red herring uh, and they're doing they're doing that because um they're they're trying to look for the bare minimum legal necessity requirement that they need to be saved and they're doing that also because they think that god, to be saved god is asking you for something right that you are to give it to him both of these are wrong right first of all there is no bare minimum legal requirement you've already failed and broken and sinned against the law so that that's out right? Second, God is not interested in the bare minimum necessities. He is a God who gives and gives and gives until your cup overflows. And thirdly, this idea of salvation is not one where he asks you for something such as give me your faith, give me your works, give me your intentions, give me your hope, give me your fear, but one where he gives, right? How do we know this? Well, you know, I have to talk about this all the time because we all keep forgetting it, myself included. Faith comes, how? Do I produce my faith? Do I just construct it within my heart? No, that's, you know, the heart, that's the idol factory, as John Calvin said, right? Rather, uh, faith comes by hearing the word of Jesus Christ, right? So faith, when when I hear the scriptures, when I read the scriptures, when when I receive the absolution from a pastor, when I am in the liturgy, when I hear the gospel sung in a glorious Lutheran hymn, when I receive the sacrament of the altar, when I think upon my baptism, there, 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 that's how faith comes, right? Not by, I don't create my faith, but faith comes from hearing the word, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and not just this, you know, John 6 again, what is, what shall we do to be saved? What is the work of God? This is the work of God, right? This is the work of God, not the work of you, that you believe in the one who he has sent, right? So also St. Paul in Ephesians, right? Faith is a gift. It's not our own doing, but a work of God, right? And and not just that, um, you're recreated in Christ Jesus to do good works, right? And it's him who works in us both that will and that work which please him. And it's in it's from this this hope of the gospel preached to us that that springs up both faith and love for all the saints. All that's St. Paul, right? That, that's Ephesians 1 and 2. That's Philippians 2.13, that's Colossians chapter 1, that's, you know, all of the scriptures are telling us the same thing. No matter what it is we think we need, God will give it. No matter how much it is we think we need, God will give more. No matter what we think God desires from us, God reminds us he requires nothing but gives all. And this is the truth. This, you know, something that, that's said in the Heidelberg Disputation, which we're really going to need to talk about if we haven't already. And we honestly, we might have already talked about it before, so maybe we'll have to dig into uh, a secondary source book on the Heidelberg Disputation. I'll have to double check if we have looked into the Heidelberg Disputation, but it's one of my favorite Luther works of all time. And there we say, it's not a confession, but it's a writing. And there we say, um, it is not God, God does not find, but God creates that which is pleasing to him. And there's no there is no there's nothing truer about our God that we have ever, ever ever written as Lutherans. That God is a creating God, right? God he creates out of love, he saves out of love, he sanctifies out of love, he prepares out of love, all of this out of free fatherly goodness, we say in the small catechism, right? We don't earn it, we don't deserve it, we don't work it. You know what I'm saying? Right. And so when he says, you know, if we do his will, we'll walk in these commandments. Honestly, you could put any kind of requirements in there you wanted to. You could say if we wear orange shoes, we'll be saved. That's not true. But if it were true, God would God would equip us with the orange shoes. Do you see what I'm saying? Right. So no matter what Polycarp means, no, no matter how you interpret him, it's go God's going to prepare you. Right. But I do I do want to say, you know, of course, Lutherans, we do have a position on this. You already know what it is. However, uh, we do also know that faith alone, even though it saves alone, it's never alone. And, and in truth, really, how, how do we understand faith? Well, not like the Protestants do, right? We understand faith as God is doing his cross to us. God is doing word and sacrament to us. And we, faith, uh, uh, in faith, receive that. And what does that mean? It doesn't mean that we do an act of will upon that. It means that it's done to us. It's done to us, right? So it, how does how does salvation come? Baptism right? And and the thing is, from this baptism comes faith and comes works, right? And this is the thing. So you can connect the key this if you want to. When he says, if if God's going to raise you up, it's if you do his will and walk in his commands and love what he loved. Well, how are we going to do that? Through word and sacrament, 
right? And this is the thing. If he says, I hear, because I hear people complain about uh, texts in the scriptures that, that seem legalistic or texts in the Holy Fathers that seem law focused or like, they'll say, oh, this looks like work salvation. Well, do you not understand who puts works in you, right? Do you think that you could do faith yourself, but you can't do this? Because this is what I hear all the time. People say, people say to me all the time, well, this is so scary because I can't, I can't become a better person. I can't do, you can't do faith either, right? That's, that's back to small catechism. I believe that I cannot believe in Jesus Christ or come to him. So add to that, please add to that. I cannot do his will. I cannot walk in his commands. I cannot love what he loves, but the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel. Enlighten me with his gifts. And he's not just given me true faith, but he's also done all this too, right? Okay, with that out of the way, now we understand all things in the world. Keeping ourselves from all unrighteousness, covetousness, love of money, evil speaking, false witnesses, not rendering evil for evil. You get the picture, right? So he's saying, if you wish to be raised up to new life, this means walking on, the, again, this is the doctrine of the two ways, walk in the in the path of life. And on that path of life is not just faith, this is not just Jesus, but the things of faith and the things of Jesus. And some of those things of faith are the commands of God. Some of those things of Jesus are loving the people he loves. Some of those things are, are avoiding the other path, you know, and that's simple. This is what the rest of it is, right? Keep yourselves from everything else, everything else, everything that is contrary to love, everything that's contrary to righteousness, everything contrary to truth, contrary to Jesus. You know what I mean? This is what he's saying. So then he moves on. Chapter three, these things, brethren, I write to you concerning righteousness, not because I take anything upon myself to do so, but because you've invited me to do. And this is a beautiful thing too. It tells us something of preaching. It tells us, it tells, what does it tell us? It tells us that uh, Polycarp really likes Augsburg Confession, Article 14. You know what I'm saying, right? That he doesn't take upon himself to preach or to teach, but rather he heeds the call of God through the church to do so. He heeds the needs of the people and he delivers, right? They have asked him to teach them on this, and so he has done, right? And where does he find all these things he teaches? He says the word of truth, right? And he says it this way, neither I nor any such one can come up to the wisdom of the blessed and glorified Paul, St. Paul the Apostle. He, when among you, accurately and steadfastly taught the word of truth in the presence of those who were then alive, and when absent from you wrote a letter, which if you carefully study, this is the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians, you will find to be the means, this is the means of grace, right? But what do we mean of grace? What is grace uh, entailing? Some will say the means of grace, this is just justification, hogwash and uh, bull truckles. That's not true. It's the means also of building you up, of strengthening you, fortifying you, of growing you, maturing you. Do you know what I'm saying? In that faith, which, ha hear this, Again, just what I was saying, has been given to you. You like you didn't create it. You didn't manifest it. You didn't make it. It was given to you as a gift. And which, being followed by hope. You know, this is that patristic thing, faith, hope, and love. That faith given to you, that hope which followed, and that love which was preceded by it all. all and love is this synonym for works. Again, so people say, oh, I'm so scared of... Polycarp to the Philippians. Here's why you should not be. Because the answer to what was on last page is right here. The answer to last chapter is this chapter, right? He says, he says to you, if you want to be risen and saved, do the will of God. Do the works of God, which are both synonyms for love. Then he says, well, how do I get love? The Holy Scriptures will put it in you. God will put it in you. Do you see, right? And this, moreover, this is the mother of us all. What's he referring to? This is this is coming back down to this idea of the Mater Ecclesia. For if anyone be inwardly possessed of these graces, of these graces, remember, building you up with the means of grace, these graces, he hath fulfilled the command of righteousness, since he that love is far from all sin. And this is <clears throat> this is why he expressly extols love. Above all, and St. Paul does too, right? He says, of you know, faith, hope, love, all these things. But but St. Paul says, love is the only one that will endure. Faith will not endure eternally. For there is a time of faith and there is a time of sight. There is a time when nobody will believe in Jesus on faith because they will see him with the eyes of the flesh. They'll see him before them. It's a passing thing. But love endures forever. And yet love cannot be had in this realm without faith, right? It cannot. So, but the love of money is the root of all evils. 
Knowing, therefore, that as we brought nothing into the world, so we can carry nothing out, let us arm ourselves with the armor of righteousness. Let us teach, first of all, ourselves to walk in the commands of the Lord. What's he saying? Don't give in to um, this, this, and it's a, it's a brief exhortation. Don't give in to this, this desire of greed, this desire of wealth, this desire to chase after the things of the world, rather chase after the, the things of God. And what are the things of God? Then we're going to look into the commands of God, not just the Decalogue, also the Beatitudes. We're going to look in every single law text, uh, Old Testament, New Testament, in the Gospels of Jesus Christ and the Epistles of St. Paul. We're going to look everywhere. And what we're going to glean from there are the things that are of God's. You know, and the things which are God's are things of love, are things of mercy, are things of grace and kindness. And this is why he says uh, to, to do this is to walk in the faith. Again, again, what faith? The faith given to them, not created by them, but given to them. Walking in the faith means what? It means love and purity. This is what he says. Uh, Tell your wives to do this. But this applies to everyone, not just wives. And he's doing the same thing Paul did, right? Uh, to wives and then to, you know, to the men and then to the uh, the deacons and the youths and the virgins and the presbyters. And, you know, this is what he's doing, right? He's doing the, the Pauline thing and he's doing it well. And so he says, what is this Christian life about? This Christian life is about walking in accordance and congruity with your faith, uh, which is given to you, which means to walk in love and purity, again, which are given to you, right? And he says to pray continually. Here also, how do we pray continually? Well, you know, the Orthodox like to say you pray continually by... um you know, by just saying the Jesus prayer continually. And that's, you know, that is literally true. If you did actually do that, you'd be praying continually. Um, but, but you know, you can also do this in a less uh, explicitly literal way. Um, but what is important about this again? You know, how do we pray continually? Well, prayer is something not that you construct, not that you do, but something that's given to you, that prayerfulness, that spirit of prayer, which is given to you, that fullness of prayer that's given to you. And when you do this, when you pray continually, prayer is an exercise of faith. Faith, again, it's given to you. And so you exercise this faith, which is given to you by believing this. And this is why Dr. Luther, when he writes of prayer, he does this in the large catechism. He does this also elsewhere. He says, truly prayer is not to speak. Truly prayer is not to sing, right? And then Augustine's getting pissed off because he says to sing is to pray twice. Luther says, no, <laughs> but, but prayer most specifically and most accurately, most poignantly, not poignantly, most, you know what I mean, at the center, at the essence of it is faith. It is to believe, it is to trust, it is to fear, it is to love, right? But do this at all times. And when you do this at all times, you will be walking in faith. You will be walking in love and purity, the things which are to be walking in faith. For all being far from all slandering, evil speaking, false witness, love of money, and every kind of evil, knowing that they are the altars of God. What does it mean they are the altars of God? They are the ones who are offering up this sacrifice, this, um, how does St. Paul say it? A reasonable sacrifice or the reasonable worship. Um, this is your, you know, let me rephrase this. Um, this is us offering up to God all of our moments. This is us worshiping him through our lives, through our ethics. And this is the thing. Ethics are a form of worship. Did you know that? The law and your doing of the law in life, this is a form of worship. Right. And so when you do so, you make yourself an altar of God, of which the the incense of Christian prayer is forever burning. Right. And the 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 the, the sacrificed Christ is made present in the world. Knowing then that God is not mocked, we ought to walk worthy of his commandment in glory. And again, just going all through this law, law, law all the time. And that's not a bad thing. Right. Then he says the deacons then should be blameless and does again the Paul thing, the same requirements, right? He says then, if we please him in this present world, coming back to that idea, we shall also receive the future world. That is if, like a uh, conditional statement, if you please him now, you will receive the future world. This is like, again, people say this is law, uh, work salvation, right? Sure. We shall receive the future world according to, uh, sorry, as he's promised to us that he will raise us again from the dead. If we live worthy of him, we shall also reign together, him, together with him, provided only that we believe. Only that we believe. So he has actually got two conditions here. Please him now, which includes the faith and then the faith. But the thing is, the faith includes the pleasing of him. Do you know what I'm saying? Because we can say all we want all day. Faith alone saves. True, that's true. But faith is never alone, right? We can say that faith apart from works uh, justifies us, and that is true. But the faith which justifies us produces works. Do you know what I'm saying? So then he says, then he says, 
Let the young men be blameless in all things, the blah, 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 right? All that Pauline stuff again, for it is well that they should be cut off from the lusts that are in the world. This is, again, the doctrine of the two ways. Let us have our young men go the way of life, not the way of death, right? Wherefore, it is needful to abstain from these things being subject to the presbyters and the deacons as unto God in Christ. This is something that we saw previously with uh, the series on uh, Clement's first epistle to the Corinthians. And it's something that we are going to see a little later in the writings of St. Ignatius of Antioch. This emphasis on the offices of the church and our submission to them and to their divine authority as unto God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice, though, uh, and and I mentioned this in the in the the Clement section again. I'm going to mention it here, just as a little as a little passing note. This is two offices, not three. He does not say to the bishops, the presbyters, and the deacons, but to the presbyters and the deacons. Why? Because in the Bible there are only two offices: presbyter and bi and bishop are synonyms. Episcopos and presby presbyteros. Right. And then he says this, and this is also coming out of Paul, straight out of Paul. The virgins also must walk in a blameless and pure conscience. Now, this idea of the virgins, the enrollment of the virgins is similar to that of the enrollment of widows. But this is also something that was practiced that which you can if you're interested in reading anything in Jewish Talmudic or Midrashic uh, literature, you can find this. Um, and I have the citation somewhere, just not in the, in my own brain, um, as to uh, the exact citation in the Talmud where you can and the uh, other rabbinic literature where you can read about this. But in the temple, they did have an enrollment. It was called the enrolled virgins of the temple, and they were exactly what it sounds like: consecrated virgins, um, basically nuns, uh, <laughs> serving in the temple, and. You know, did this exist in the early church? Yes, but not exactly as we would know and understand nuns now today. It's a little more complicated than that. But then he gets on to the, the, the presbyters uh, themselves and again does so just as Paul does. But then he says something super interesting here. Um, and this is, again, re regarding how we live, right? Um, if we entreat the Lord to forgive us, we also ought to forgive. For we are before the eyes of the Lord and God, and we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and must every one give an account of himself. So why is it? Why is it that we are to forgive others? Uh, because we will be judged if we do not. Right? Again, you can sense the legal emphasis in the writings of Saint Polycarp. He says. Whoever does not confess that Jesus has come in the flesh is antichrist, and whoever does not confess the testimony of the cross is of the devil, and whoever perverts the oracles of the Lord to his own lusts, and all says that there is neither a resurrection nor a judgment, he is the firstborn of Satan. Wherefore, forsaking the vanity of many and their false doctrines, let us return to the word which has been handed down to us from the beginning. So, it's a... Uh, Everybody and their grandmother's dog is always trying to talk about the Antichrist, it seems. Um, if I walk down the street, I will look at signs saying that Kamala Harris or that Donald Trump are the Antichrist. If I look somewhere else, I'll see that Netanyahu is the Antichrist. If I look somewhere else, I will see, you know, if I go back in time, Obama will become the Antichrist. If, if I look in, in certain Lutheran writings, the Pope is the Antichrist. But, you know, the reality of this is just as St. Polycarp says, because this is straight up from, you know, the letters of First John. Whoever says that Jesus Christ is not come in the flesh, he's Antichrist. If anyone denies that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, he, well, he's Antichrist. If anybody denies that Jesus Christ uh, saved the whole world through the cross, then he's Antichrist. So who's Antichrist then? Well, it's not an individual. It's most people. It's, mo it's most people, right? And this, again, it relates to the doctrine of the two ways. And people don't know this because... Well, why don't they know this? That's a good question. Probably because the doctrine of the two ways is not taught, even though it is the bedrock of most patristic teaching, and so it should be, right? But when you look at this idea of the, the Antichrist in modern evangelical writing, they're looking at it as at one individual. Or maybe you'll have some smaller Antichrist and a big, big, big Antichrist, right? But the doctrine of the two ways is the is the root of this actual understanding coming out in both the New Testament literature, like the scriptures, as well as the patristic writings. And and there it's you are either of the of the Holy Spirit in Christ or you are, are Antichrist, right? There there are, are only two spirits. You see this also show up in the Marburg Colloquy, right? Where where Dr. Luther says to Ulrich Zwingli, You're of a different spirit. Well, which spirit? 
He's a unique spirit? No, not a unique spirit of the unholy one, the unholy kind, the demonic spirit, the satanic spirit. And this is what Polycarp is saying. If you, you know, it's it's not about you being a specific individual. It's that you do not accept Christ, that you deny Christ. You do not accept the witness of the testimony of the cross. You do not accept the resurrection. You do not accept the love of God in Jesus. And so you are the firstborn of Satan. But... What is the what is what is the solution to this? If you if you say, well, oh, that's me. Well, no worries. Return to the word, <laughs> handed down from the beginning, right? Repent, believe. Salvation is for all. And so, then he says, let us continue then continually persevering in hope and in the earnestness of the, our righteousness. And this is important: our righteousness, which is what, which is Jesus Christ who bore our sins on his own body in the tree, who did no sin, neither guile was found in his mouth, but endured all things for us that we might live in him. Right? And this is the thing. How, how will the righteous live? How will the righteous live? Will the, will the righteous live by doing and preserving and enduring in the law? No. The righteous will live by walking in faith. Right? By walking in Christ. By finding their life in Jesus Christ and their righteousness in Jesus Christ. For in him we have become the very righteousness of God, says St. Paul. Now he continues, thus do in assurance that all these have not ruined in vain, but in faith and righteousness, and that they are now in due place in the presence of the Lord. These are dead people, right? But what's he saying? In assurance, we do this. We don't do all this. We don't walk in faith and love and hope, striving out of fear that we won't make it. But he says in the assurance of faith, right? That we will not run in vain, but run in faith. What does it mean to run in faith? It means to run in assurance, right? What does it mean to run in righteousness? It means to make Christ your righteousness. And thus, those who do this, and when they die, we don't say, oh, I don't know where he is. I don't claim to know into the mind of God. No, we just say they are now in their due place in the presence of the Lord. Why? Because of the objective grace of baptism, the objective grace of the absolution, the objective grace of the Holy Eucharist, present and active, alive in our lives and in those who have died, right? And this is the reality. Stand fast, therefore, in these things. Follow the example of the Lord, being firm and unchangeable in the faith, loving the brotherhood, joined together in the truth, exhibiting the meekness of the Lord. So all of these things, this idea of faith, this idea of love, this idea of hope for Polycarp, they're one thing. They're one thing. One thing altogether. Now, there's an interesting thing here. He quotes Tobit. I just want you to see this so that you cannot deny that uh, the Holy Fathers quote Tobit. Why do I want you to see this? It's just my own sick uh, obsessions here. This alms deliver from death, Tobit 410, 12, 9. There you go. It's right there. Um, and what does this mean? This is that same kind of thing of alms uh, cover a multitude, or sorry, um, love covers a multitude of sins. It's the same kind of idea, right? So people say, oh, I don't accept the, the Deuterocanon because there's something heretical in Tobit. Get off your rocker, right? Stop it. That's not true. And if that's true, then uh, John and First John, you know, this is also heretical. But it's not. Neither, neither are heretical. So, um, <clears throat> now, I am greatly grieved for Valens, who was once a presbyter among you, because he so little understands the place that was given him in the church. I exhort you, therefore, that you abstain from covetousness, and that you be chaste and truthful. Abstain every form of evil. For if a man govern himself in such matters, how shall he enjoin them on others? If a man does not keep himself from covetousness, he shall be defiled by idolatry, and shall be judged as one of the heathen. But who of us are ignorant of the judgment of the Lord? Do we not know that the saints shall judge the world, as Paul teaches? But I have neither seen nor heard of any such thing among you in the midst of whom the blessed Paul labored and who are commended in the beginning of his epistle. For he boasts of you in those churches, which alone then knew the Lord, but we of Smyrna had not yet known him. I am deeply grieved therefore brethren for him and his wife to whom may the Lord grant true repentance. And so you can kind of notice the way that they're speaking of fallen pastors of, of one that is, you know, kind of warning against that same issue that they don't fall into it. But then also, is one that's not saying like, oh, he's a he's a dog, he's an evil person. I hate this guy. How dare he? How how dare he have moral failings? No, but it is wishing for the repentance of the person. Now he exhorts them to various graces, and then concerns the you know the transmission of the epistles. He's basically done here. But something that's super super interesting. I mean, you might want to read this one over in your own time. But um, one thing that I think is super interesting for us to contemplate about. 
uh, Polycarp's letter to the Philippians is um, how emphatically he exhorts, not exhorts, uh, extols the writings of St. Paul. And this is important because we see the use of St. Paul, not only in his writings as taken for granted as scripture, but as a huge apostolic figure to the churches that he ministered to personally. Um, and this is like, you know, this is the uh, disciple of the apostles. And so you've got here this idea of Pauline supremacy in certain churches arising already. So, but it's, it's also kind of interesting that, you know, the guy that's doing this Pauline supremacy thing is super legalistic. And I don't mean that in a bad way. He's just like super law focused and St. Paul's not. So, but he says, I trust that you are well versed in the sacred scriptures and that nothing is hidden from you. But to me, this privilege is not yet granted. So he's taking this kind of huge humility saying, you know, to this congregation, I bet you are so knowledgeable in the scriptures, but I don't really know anything. But he says, it is then declared in these scriptures, be angry and sin not and let not the sun go down in your wrath. Happy is he who remembers this, which I believe to be the case with you. But may the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ himself, who is the son of God and our everlasting high priest, Build you up in faith and truth and meekness, gentleness, long suffering, forbearance, and purity. And what's the what's so important about this is this. Again, hitting on you know this point, this fact that it is Christ who builds us up in faith. It is Christ who gives us faith. It is Christ who matures us in faith. It is Christ who adorns our faith with good works. In all things that we think we need, that we think we want in regard to salvation or Christian life. Not us, but Christ. This is the message of uh, Polycarp to the Philippians. So hope that was fun for you. God bless you guys.